I should say, the book is a lot of fun as well as being about some serious things. Is it? Back me up here. <laughs> I thought that totally. I'm, it's like I'm looking. Who else will say that? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I used the S word earlier. I mean, it's 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 fun, but also you you manage to just you know explain machine machine learning. Right. Right. Now I, yeah. Then. Yeah. So the library was my space, and there was just so much. To the Harbor Grace excursion with the boys to have a time. This book is sexy. Oh, thank you very much. It's good. scary. Yeah. But it's kind of sexy too. Th that yeah, that's good. It's certainly it's certainly exciting. I I feel very much that um, in an in the era that we're in right now, if you're choosing to read a book, then you're choosing it over Netflix and video games and social media, and I want to make it really fun for you. I would like to show the reader a good time. Bring them along with me. Have some crazy adventures. Have some interesting thoughts you know, enjoy. I'm, I've been very pleased to see people on social media saying, I read this in a day. And I'm like, wow. great, you know, couldn't put it down. That's good. Yeah. I love that you mentioned fun and that you're writing in an attention economy, because in a lot of ways, you're writing about the attention economy, about how we're ensnared, what's in our pockets, what's on our mind, where those power imbalances are and where they're not. And when I say that the book is sort of sensual, you know, there, there's, a, there's a frisson and it's so, it's so modern and it, you see yourself in this book, whether I'm you good. like it or not, <laughs> or know it or not, right, as it, as it comes up. Um, a couple of elements, elements that jumped out to me. The only way to know the future is to control it. The only way to really control the future, this could have been a difference between my ARC and my e-reader, you tell me. Mm -hmm. The only way to really control the future is if you're the one making it happen. Yeah, I think that's true. I think, I, I know, I think both those things are in the book. Okay, um, yeah, because, uh, so, so the novel is, is, it's about technology billionaires. Um, in, the, in the novel, I uh, invent a, an artificial intelligence product that they have created, which will tell them when the apocalypse is coming. And uh, uh, the novel opens with them getting the alert from this software to say, it's time now. You've got to leave and go to your survival bunkers, which incidentally, they do have in real life mm. bunkers that they will go to whilst the rest of us suffer and die. So, so that, that's, a, that's a lovely comforting thought for us this evening. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of what I was thinking about when I was writing the book is, is you know, what what is, the, I think I think when we hear about those survival bunkers, we can sort of feel somehow that there's something incredibly wrong with that. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting to think about precisely what it is that has gone wrong there. Uh, one of the things, obviously, is if you are somebody who's um, feels that they will be sufficiently happy just to go, okay, everybody else will die, but I and my immediate friends will be fine, then probably you're not somebody who has the values to then be able to create a good society and life afterwards. So that's, that's certainly something that's up there. But also this question about like, how much can you actually control? Yeah. How much can you predict? How much can you control? Uh, there certainly seems like there's a feeling of no, 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 no. We can, we can do it. We can, we can like shape the future. But um, yeah, it doesn't work out for them that way in the book anyway. <laughs> We're sort of one, you know, one data set away, one acquisition away. Right. Because you mentioned the getting the alert, and uh, there's a there's a sort of throwaway where some people kind of maybe didn't uh, evacuate or do something because they didn't take it seriously enough because they didn't get the alert. And you know the systems that give us environmental alerts or amber alerts are provided you know through public infrastructure but through private mm -hmm. companies to us and and that sort of oh, something yes. that was really I thought interesting to kind right. of just have there. Yes, I have that at one point. That that that's like it's like two lines set in Canada. <laughs> I mean, there is more than that. Like Canada underlined. Yeah, no, no, no. There is. There, there's, there's, there's quite a, t a talk about Haida Gwaii, and like whether that would be a good place to escape to, because uh, I've I've done a bunch of travelling in Canada. Um, but uh, yeah, I have I have some people get into like yeah they miss they miss a crucial alert about the weather, and they end up um, freezing to death, and. Yeah, how much trust do we put in these systems? Um, there's a sort of secret subtitle for the book. Well, 
Not anymore. Tell yeah. us right now. <laughs> this, this, yeah, the secret subtitle for it was Trust or something to do with trust. Mm. But then somebody named a book Trust and then won the Pulitzer Prize, so I couldn't do that. Um, <laughs> <but> <laughs> that's true. But uh, it's, yeah, it's a question about why, in some cases, we trust these electronic systems more than we trust ourselves or other humans or... I don't know, ideas that have been current in society for hundreds or thousands of years, but instead we're trusting the AI to do stuff for us. What is that about? And uh, can and should we stop? Yes, we should stop. <laughs> One Spoiler. element that, that stood out to me about, you know, who can we trust? You know, is it uh, surviving as individuals, surviving as a society where we can sort of go together? is you have this wonderful through line of people chatting on a message boards. Oh, yeah. So there's an anonymity that seems to, you know, create a community of care, sharing information, and it's, it's, a, it's a place of trust, but also a place where there's sort of survivalist uh, influencers. Right. You know, there's still capital in that, in that ecosystem of so sort of sharing information. But um, how did that sort of come through to you, too, in terms of, a, a more modern kind of form of community because it strikes me that elements like Reddit, which you, do, which you don't really critique, you don't have to critique every single tech mm -hmm. company or sort of take us on, do end up creating kind of surprising communities of care or sort of vigilant information sharing. Right. I mean, you know, sometimes when talking about this book, people say to me, but what are, you, are, you, are you for technology or are you against it? And <laughs> it, no, it's, no, it's not that simple. Technology is a tool, just like a knife. You can use a knife to chop a salad or you can use it to harm somebody. We've got to think about how we're using these technologies. So are there amazing communities of care that form online around all sorts of different things? There are communities out there that have formed around a shared love of a TV show that has end, have ended up taking care of somebody through, you know, a, a terrible depression or through a, a, a loss of a family member. That sort of stuff does happen. Also, there are communities where people got together because they love a book and they end up just destroying each other. You know, they're, they're, and, they, and they turn into abusive, hostile, horrible environments. And there are things, and listen, this is your thing, so I'm going to ask you about this, but there are uh -oh. things we can do to make the communities more likely to be caring and less likely to be horrible. Um, some of those are about moderation. And uh, yeah, what, what can we do? What can we do to encourage that to be more the case, that the communities are good? Well, I mean, you do this lovely kind of, you know, whispering through these technology companies in, in the book. Now, I'm not doing a total spoiler, but just what are ways we can make things a little bit more positive, a little mm. bit more collaborative? But what are the ramifications of that down the line? Do we realize what we carry with us when we share an innocuous update? Hey, I'm, I'm heading to the library to see this epic book talk and you know <laughs> someone writes like oh i hate that library or you know don't you have anything you know i didn't read the book i, I have no idea this is not a good example you know <laughs> how how do we sort of tend to allow kind of pollution to accrue on these systems because you also hit on the companies not evading but being very intertwined with government forces right uh sharing information or sort of not sharing information so how do we make it better i mean personally mm -hmm. i think there is always a role for the state to make markets more free and fair right. and most of the time we have de facto private regulators that are creating these marketplaces and then skewing them in their favor mm -hmm. so the incentives the previous incentives that existed are for more polarizing content, right. survivalist or not, to sort of be, I mean, be shared. Yes, absolutely. This is something that I should say, the book is a lot of fun as well as being about some serious things. Is it, back me up here. <laughs> I thought that totally. I, it's like I'm looking, who else will say that? Yes, yeah. I mean, I used the S word earlier. I mean, it's, it's, it's fun, but also you, you managed to just, you know, explain machine learning. Right, right. Now I, and yeah, then. yeah. So um, in terms of, in terms of, um, what we do about about communities and um, yeah, breaking things up. I want okay. So so here I am talking to somebody who really knows about breaking up technology companies or how you could create more competition in that marketplace. How we could create more governance. I think there's also um, which which I, I really want to come to. So but I have a friend in the UK, Rachel Caldicott, who runs um, a think tank on technology called Careful Trouble, and she talks a lot about enough internet. 
Mm. So have we got enough internet now? Yeah, does anybody here feel like we don't yet have enough internet? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that's an incredibly important thought and feeling, which is, now, there are people out there who don't have as much internet as we have in London or in Toronto, and there are people who need it to access vital services, and maybe instead of going, whatever is the new thing, I want to be making something where you can like have a thing projected onto the inside of your glasses to tell you who somebody is when you're looking at them. Maybe, actually, what we could do right now is not go more, 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 but instead go, okay, we have enough internet now. I mean, we're not going to do this, but let's, let's pretend that we would have governments that would do this, to say, we have enough now, and actually, the thing would be to bring others up to the level that we're at, rather than all of us needing to be... I think, does anybody here feel like you could do with a little bit less internet in your life? Yeah. Yeah, anybody here, no, but anybody here feel like they want more internet in their lives? No, no, okay. So I think that's where we are now, and it's important to recognize that's happened in the past 25 years. It's happened incredibly quickly. Actually, I think we probably went from enough internet to too much internet in the past decade. So, you know, typically when we look back at human history, we look at the, at the parts that had very, very rapid technological change, and we now look at them and go, oh, that was a lot of human rights abuses that happened there. And, you know, I come from the UK where we had the Industrial Revolution first, and, you know, that was a lot of people getting their hands mangled in mills before we finally, like, figured out how to do, you know, working hours legislation and... Um, you know, you can't go to work in a mill if you're under 12 years old, maybe. Um, and, you know, workers need health care and workers need weekends off and all of these sort of things that we've developed. So I think we are at that point now of going, it's done, it's done all these great things. Right now it just seems to be... The, the <sighs> what I tend to say, right, is... This, this is just my guess. My guess is that we have now reached all of the useful advances in digital communication for a generation. Mm. I don't think that there's going to be gains to be gotten out of that anymore. There may be, a f a few, there may be some um, uh, uh, ways in which we'll be able to streamline, simplify um, economies of scale, but I don't think we're going to be coming up with stuff that, you know, when we all saw, oh, I have a device that can send a text message to somebody else, we were like, <gasps> that's actually really useful. I can really see how that's going to improve my life. And even up to, I don't know, sending a video message, doing video calling, or that was already mm -hmm. like, oh, amazing. You know, granny on one side of the world can speak to a on the, uh, grandchild on the other side of the world. Fantastic. Um, I suspect that the gains that are going to be made in the next 30 years are more likely to be uh, medical technology. Uh, personalized medicine, biotech, um, things where you might get a lateral flow test which can test you for 40 different things and tell you what's going on. Morning, you know, a little swab and then it will tell you what's going on with various, like, hormones, chemicals in your body, little monitors stuck onto you. Um, I think that stuff is, is that, that seems to be where that's kind of excitingly moving forward. Um, and digital technology, maybe we just need to be able to go, it's fine now. We've, we've got enough. Uh, and what are the forces that are causing us to not feel like we have enough? It's At this point, instead of being like, we're selling you a useful thing that you can tell is incredibly helpful for your life, it's more like the drug dealer model, mm. <laughs> where it's, I can show you something that then you're going to want more and more and more of, even though you hate yourself afterwards. So... That feels useful to say out loud, right? I think it's useful. I mean, yeah. we're, a lot of the digital technologies you're talking about, we're powering them. Yeah. And you use the word gains, and that makes me wonder, like, what kind of gains, right? Because economic gains, mm -hmm. at some point, you know, those are not accrued to us. Right. Right? There's the kind of shareholder motivation, and you sort of start to reimagine tech capitalism right. and digital capitalism as well. And you also, you know, your pendulum swings, because these... 
uh, tech CEOs, these billionaires who we can kind of imagine their proxies, they collude and they're closer than at least we imagine uh, the kind of dominant, most uh, dominant corporate leaders to be. Right. They're in communication. They're, you know, collaborating on their technology now and then. It's almost like... Um, Mm, I don't know a lot of social, like uh, good film references, like Avengers. What is it? That, you know, oh, everyone, Avengers everyone's Assemble, bringing yeah. something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. So I, I just, I was just in the U.S. last week, and I did an event with um, Kara Swisher, who's a technology journalist who actually knows a lot of these billionaires. So I was also saying to her, "Come on, what you know?" I, she read the novel, and she was not unconvinced. <laughs> so that's sort of terrifying to me because I felt like I was writing a novel that was sort of way out there. But to be fair, subsequent to my having written this novel, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg challenged each other to a cage fight. Oh. So uh, what can you say? Um, and yeah, she was saying the, the problem is, is that the regulators are not doing their jobs. So, mm. all right, now I'm going to ask you a question, okay? Because we have an expert here in competition in digital technologies, right? Yeah. So um, this, this is a very important question. If, if we, somebody reviewed my novel and said this is anti-capitalist, and I'm like, Ugh. it's not anti-capitalist, it's pointing out the problems with capitalism, which is a different thing. Capitalism has got us some great things. Also, I fully believe in a mixed system, and charity are also important, government is also important, NGOs are also important, anyway. So, um, what I would say about this is capitalism works when it works, if there is competition. That's how it's supposed to work. The free marketplace works when we can take, we can go, oh look, there's eight companies I can go to to have my, um, I don't know, social media or whatever, and I'm gonna pick the one that has, for example, the best privacy, the best data collection policies, the one that's gonna most look after me. But we're not in that place now. If you wanna do go you know, Google search, ha ha. You can't, if you wanna do an internet search, um, then there's a place to go. And if you want to talk to your friends, then they're on a platform and you can't necessarily find them elsewhere. So, I, I heard an, an idiot on BBC Radio a few years ago saying, well, you can't break up technology companies. What are you going to do? Have one Facebook for your friends from, uh, whose surnames are A to F and then another one for you know, the, the, the next part of the alphabet and then on? So tell me, how do we break them up? How do we break them up? <laughs> So, you know, in a Canadian context, we often benefit, we, we let other regulators do our homework for us a little mm -hmm. bit, right? And we hope that there might be spillover effects later. Um, one way to kind of proxy breakups is through better interoperability. Mm -hmm. So if through your Fantail account, one of the companies, you know, you can also message on a different platform or get to your... Um, I'm forgetting the name of the, the message board. I have to like flip oh, my it's papers. Called, it's called Name the Day. Yeah. Thank you. Um, no problem. Then that's a way where you're kind of giving consumers a little bit more power, where you're not as kind of trapped. Because the mm. stickiness of Facebook is, uh, it's this sunk cost where it has some of your photos, mm. or you know, Instagram for years has now been kind of what would otherwise be a kind of private photo photo book in your home where you're sort of right. protecting the doubles. And then you kind of know that maybe you should leave, but you don't or right, because they draws are, you, there's no other way to use marketplace right they're allowed to make it incredibly difficult to move everything yes and even though that's all stuff that you put there there's no law that says you've got to make it one button you click it and it doesn't argue with you it just moves all your stuff somewhere else right but that, that should be the law right let's remake the law right now yeah well, <laughs> to, to, to one of your elements in, in the book where uh, a main character sort of leverages the company that she works at <laughs> to de-anonymize and find somebody that she's been messing with on this message board for years, sort of using clues mm -hmm. based on a photo that this person's profile has said or sort of their digital exhaust that, that they were paying attention to and manages to show up at their door. Mm -hmm. I think that and this also was someone who was careful. And this was yeah. someone who was deliberately careful and yeah. sort of aware. 
um, I think ends up being a bit of a reminder that the what these companies purport to be to us ends up being something that's quite different. Mm. So in Canadian, sorry, it's so boring to be Canadian. Uh, it's our, wonderful to be Canadian. No, no, it's so this boring for me to be like, and this is something in public policy, so I'll say it super quickly. No, I love um, a bit of public policy. Come on, we're all <laughs> in a reference library. Your word, a, you know what I mean? On it's Monday like, evening. roll it up, roll it <laughs> we, up. We want some actual information. <laughs> Um, our, our competition law doesn't actually explicitly have anything around excessive pricing. So other hmm. uh, antitrust cases against, say, Facebook has, have sort of said, there's an imbalance here. The price of participation on the platforms, it's too much mm. for what you're getting in return. To give up all your data and information and your messages and your browsing history is, is the cost is too high mm -hmm. to be able to go creep your frenemy from 11 years ago, which is like <laughs> what we're kind of doing right now and then, let's be real, or like find something. No, you stay connected. There are like certainly benefits, but again, the companies are, are something different. And back to Canada, you know, we can let other jurisdictions do our homework for us without sort of confronting, what am I saying now? Like the man in the mirror, look at all my terrible references. You know, for us, Loblaw is a company that's not unlike Hmm. the companies you were talking about. Ostensibly, it's a grocer, but mm -hmm. it has a financial arm. It has huh. a very deep loyalty program that also knows our health information huh. and pharmacy. Uh, so our your, yeah. your friend who's a competition lawyer might want to <laughs> say, say more that we were meeting earlier. But again, <laughs> at, at face, we're, we're slow to kind of catch up because we don't always recognize what's actually happening here or, or mm. what's valuable in the exchange. And... Uh, you know, data, these common kind of common elements that we may give to companies that then they leverage again for themselves to train their model. You know, we we think we're just using a free video calling system, but mm -hmm. it's uh, recording our face and our voice right. and our cadence and translation. Was that the bargain that we signed up for? And I think, you know, you can also remake the bargain. And that's, I think, part of a hopeful future right. that comes through this kind of near future end of the world we're on the brink there's mm -hmm. this beautiful line the world was a boxer unsteady on its feet wavering waiting for the final punch yeah. and <laughs> no I know but it does it not feel sometimes like we're there are we not getting pushed to yeah. the edge are we not feeling the winds kind of blowing down the pyramid of cards or yeah. that the dominoes have started to be going so Ooh. what do we want to rebuild and back to a gro grocery store? Now it's like being recorded and I'm talking about blah, blah. I'm obsessed with this company. Um, the food and grocery delivery business became a nonprofit, taking money from wealthy people, buying artisanal yogurt and plowing it into at cost, healthy, entirely plant, entirely plant composed meals around the world. Why aren't we getting there now? Why, we have right. these values as, as citizens, as communities. Right. What's stopping us? Okay, okay. I have so many things to say now. I've been like Good. trying to use mnemonics lay, lay in my now. mind to like remember them all. Okay, so first of all, um, in terms of how it should be with your social media, I'm going to give you an Too example. Loud. No, poor, poor. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't be frightened. Just do it. I also have a carrot I was just going to yeah. eat. It's in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I hope you don't mind. No, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, okay. So how it should work is the following. Um, your friends belong to you. Like that's your, you made those friends. Internet companies do not own the concept of friendship and they did not make those friends for you. The fact that you sometimes met a friend there doesn't make, mean that they, you know, they're your friends. And when you want to talk to them, you certainly should be able to transfer all your data from one company to another, but even more so, you should be able to sign up to an app that will show you what you want to see rather than whatever filters they have put in. So um, my, my mom died in March, and this was a very, you know, that's a, that's a difficult time. And at that time, what I really wanted was to see updates from my friends about their dogs, about recipes they were enjoying, you know, updates about their kids. I really did not want to see even my closest, loveliest friend uh, having a big stress about the news. And if, if this all worked in the way that it could work in a human-centered way, then I should be able to have an app 
that I have picked, that I use, that takes all the data that my friends would like to share, and I say, listen, please just show me recipes and you know what people are having for lunch today, and please show me photos of their pets, and please cut out anything to do with the news. We have all of that technology exists right now. This is not complicated stuff. And the fact that they're not doing that and not making that functionality available and not allowing things to come cross-platform, obviously cross-platform, they, they want to be the ones who own your friendships. And um, in terms of what emotions they want, they do, they do better if, you know how like the, 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 the junk food you can't stop eating is the stuff that combines sweet and savory? Or like, or like you're going kind of nachos cookies, nachos cookies. And so it's exactly like that on, on social media where it's going, here's a lovely picture of someone's puppy. Here's a horrible news story. Now you need to feel better. Carry on looking for, the, for a lovely puppy or, you know, somebody's wonderful, you know, photo of their kids or whatever. But then we're going to show you that. You're going to keep looking. You're feeling okay. Now we're going to show you something horrible again. Carry on. Keep going. Keep going. So um, they, they are, I have a line in the book where I say they are strip mining human sanity for coins. And I stand by that completely. Um, they've invented some wonderful things and they should certainly profit from it to a certain extent. However, um, I think with privacy stuff, we tend to um, try to get people interested in it by making them scared. And I would like to suggest to everybody here and everyone watching online, instead of being scared, I would love you to be extremely angry. Mm. Because the value of these companies mostly comes, in many cases, from purely the data that the companies have collected. Um, my friend who's a lawyer who works on these mergers and acquisitions is in the front row going, yes, that's right. Um, artificial intelligence, so-called, uh, derives, essentially, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna explain machine learning to you before we get to 45 minutes, okay? And then yes. you're gonna understand it forever. Um, but essentially, you, this is not the explanation, this is just this is, this is a sort of prefe preface, which is um, those machines, those, those, those programs have gone through the internet and taken all the information from the internet and used it to, tra to train their programs. Really, an artificial intelligence program is a very neat way to search the internet. All the stuff on the internet was put there by us. And it's as if they have invented a new kind of I don't know, like presentation tray, which they can, sh and because they've invented the presentation tray, now they feel like they own all the things that go on it or can go onto it. So um, all of those companies, the vast amount of the value of them really belongs to all of us in common. Now, we don't necessarily have good laws and systems to understand what it means to have created something in common. But this is what we've done. We've all been on these platforms or on the internet saying, hey, somebody says that they've got too much rhubarb. Well, I'm going to give them my top three recipes for rhubarb. You know, this person needs some advice about what to do about his carburetor. I'm going to sort that, you know. We've given that in a kind of loving, giving spirit of human beings trying to reach out to each other and trying to help each other. And a bunch of companies have gone, now that belongs to us. So. Um, let me now explain to you machine learning. Everybody ready? So if nothing else, you, come, you go home this evening, you go, now I know how AI works. And you, at the end, you'll go, oh, is that all it is? All right, you ready? It's like having a magic trick like a little bit ruined. Yeah. <laughs> In a good way. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm planning. Well, you'll be able to see how it's clever and also how it's not all that. OK. And certainly, it's not a person. All right, so we're familiar with the game of tic-tac-toe. Imagine, if you will, in your minds, a tic-tac-toe board in which each square of those nine squares is a different color. All right, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, whatever, more colors, right. You know, black, white, brown. You don't have to remember the colors. I'm just giving examples of colors. Uh, so you're imagining that. Now we imagine a huge number of matchboxes in fact, it is 304 matchboxes, but you also don't need to remember that. 
We've tipped all the matches out, and in each matchbox, uh, on the front of the matchbox is, the, is a drawing of a different board state that is possible in tic-tac-toe. So that is to say, maybe there's one board state which is it's empty apart from an O over here. Maybe there's another board state which is there's an O here, an O here, and an X over here, right? OK, are we all following so far? Yeah, yeah, OK, good, nodding. Uh, inside each of the matchboxes are beads with colors corresponding to the open squares. So, you know, if there's, an, if there's a, so we remembered that we had, we had colors for the squares, beads of the color corresponding to the squares where you could potentially play an X or an O, right? Everybody there? Now you can get these matchboxes to play tic-tac-toe. So you start out, you put an O here, then you find the matchbox that has that board state written on it, and you shake it up and you tip into your hand a single bead, and that is the move that it plays. So if it's the blue square, you put its X in the blue square, right? The first, it's random, okay. So the first time that machine, those, that, those matchboxes play tic-tac-toe, uh, it will lose really badly. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna have an X and another X underneath it, and everybody knows you should put an O here, but instead it's gonna put an O way over here, right? Here is the clever thing. Once it has played, and prob very probably lost, if it loses a match, uh, a game of tic-tac-toe, then you go through and take out one bead for, of each of the ones that it used to get to that state. Right? So if it used, you know, you take out the bees that led, the, the, uh, the route that led to a loss. If it happened to win a game of tic-tac-toe, then you add in an extra bead of the color of each of the way, of, of, for each of the moves it played to get to that win. And then you do that over and over and over and over and over and over again. And after you've played about a thousand games of, games of tic-tac-toe, that machine is superb. And it looks like it understands tic-tac-toe, but it does not. The person who understood tic-tac-toe is you. It can't tell whether it's won or lost. You are the one who can tell, and you have stored your knowledge in this very interesting fashion. It's super clever. It's very, very clever, but it was your knowledge that's stored in all those matchboxes and beads, your understanding of what the game is. So when people talk about an iterative process, that is doing it again and again and again, where you play the games again and again. When people talk about um, training an AI, what they mean is that there was a real human person there saying you got this right or you got this wrong, over and over again, whether it was playing tic-tac-toe or whether it was trying to come up with a good answer to the question, what is love? And you do it again and again and again, and Actually, they have vast numbers of people, I think in Ghana, who've been training the AI models in that way to just tell them whether they got it right or wrong. Uh, this machine was actually, it was invented in 1961 by, um, at that point, a computer scientist called uh, Donald Mikey. And because in the UK, tic-tac-toe is called noughts and crosses, he called it the machine educable, educable noughts and crosses engine, uh, or menace for short. <laughs> which would in many ways be a better name for this. So now, if you've followed me thus far, you've understood how machine learning works. They, they do it incredibly quickly. You don't have to go through and shake the beads now. You know, with, a, with modern um, processes, you can be doing you know, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of calculations a second. And so you know, the, a, a, a version of that machine that was uh, is a computer program will be able to become perfect at tic-tac-toe in like a second even or even less. Um, but it still doesn't actually understand stuff. And when you think about what your process is of thinking or what your process is of talking to someone, I think, I mean, tell me if anybody here feels like in order to understand what words to say, they run in their mind through all the possibilities and then pick one at random. I, <laughs> aiming for, to like, for like a win. But I don't, I don't think most of us do that. I think most of us are doing an empathic leap, trying to reach out to somebody else, understand what they want, what they want to hear, you know, who we are, want to be in this conversation. It's a genuine communication. Whereas your chat GPT is doing 
iterative processes and machine learning. So there you go. Now you have learned something. And, uh, and you'll be able to go home and go, yeah, I understand how that works. <laughs> I mean, I hope people are learning a lot. I'm uh, cycling through different questions I can ask you because yeah. we've only got 10 minutes. Oh, left. no. But I'm not doing it randomly. I'm also like <laughs> thinking of captures for some reason. I'm like, okay, I've got to click all the taxis mm -hmm. in these boxes. We've got to go. Um, you, I, I mentioned that you sort of gesture at platform governance and the relationships between these technology companies and government. But what you're kind of also asking is their duty to us mm. if, if they owe us sort of anything. And in, in thinking about... They owe us everything. 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 If they made that money out of all of us, right, and they trained their models using all of our stuff, then a significant amount of the value of all of these most valuable companies in the world ought to belong to humanity in common. And sometimes you'll say, well, what, 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 how can you have something that's owned by humanity in common? And I feel it's very simple. Um, these values have been held by most humans through you know, the, the majority of human history, which is you have something that is valuable, or you're a wealthy, powerful person, what do you do? You feed the hungry, you house the homeless, you take care of the vulnerable, which in this case also includes the environment that we're living in. Um, I don't think it's complicated, actually. I think they can make it seem very complicated. Uh, you know, there are sort of antitrust filings saying, um, oh no, if you make us do this, then our company will completely lose value. And you go, well... The, yeah, let's yeah. find out. Yeah. <laughs> There's only one way to find out. Yeah. Let's test that hypothesis. <laughs> well, some of what you point to, too, not just what, what they owe us, you know, in terms of how they've created our value, but to the extent that certain companies may truly know elements of the future in the sense that uh, an economist at Google has written, former economist at Google, you know, a post-2008 recession in certain parts of the U.S. that were hit the hardest, they expected, this is actually a very uh, challenging example, but it's true, they expected that rates of reported child abuse would increase. Mm. And they tried to allocate public resources in that way. Time passed, and they were like, oh, looking at the numbers, they're like, hey, this is great. The incident rate didn't increase. Hmm. When you looked at Google searches that were geo-targeted in that area, there was so much more, um, why is dad mad all the time? <gasps> why did mom hit me? That's information that a private company holds and knows, mm. but it's relevant for the public good, for public safety. Why don't we know that? When people search, when there's a much higher probability, if I search uh, stomach ache, sore boob in that order, that I could have breast cancer. Wow. And a company knows this. Is anyone going to tell me? Right. So it's not just, you know, reclaiming, when you were saying get mad, you know, reclaiming our individualized data. Hey, that was my picture mm. of me and Naomi at the book talk. <laughs> hey, that was my review of that book. It's also, you know, the inferences. And, and to my mind, inferencing is what you're pointing to a lot of the time in the future. I'm not asking a question. I just wanted to no, tell no, you no. that. But I just want to, like, have some feelings about what you just yeah, said, which is do. to say... Um, yeah, when we imagine a child Googling, why did mommy hit me? That feels like any other previous generation, a, anywhere that a child would have the ability to ask that question would also be somebody who would be... Intervening. You're right. Able and willing to raise an alert. Yeah. And the idea that you can now ask that question to... Google, and they not only do they not have to do anything, but they will defend their right to say, no, we must not do anything. Yeah. That's, that's We're really, just the platform. That's really fucking sick. We're just the platform. That's, that's really, really disturbing, and I'm very, very glad that you've said it, because these, these systems can work any way that we want. You know, we've invented them. We, we have governments that control how things work, and how is it possible that we've allowed a situation to come up where a child is reaching out for help and no help is there? And we're just going, well, you know, this is this free market economics, kid. Like, nobody's going to come. Sorry, that's that. Oh. 
Well, and that's why we have to remake these markets. You have in the book, no fantail tablet has, re has refused to locate a gun store. Yeah. No search has refused to turn up information on how to kill someone in 70 different ways. We could have made technology like that. We thought it was better not to get involved, improve market share, leave it to the invisible hand of uh, buying and selling to sort things out, et cetera, et cetera. Let me squeeze in something else before we get to turn it <laughs> to you and your questions. And thank you for your patience with us. We've danced over so many topics. Doomsday cult. Yeah. Cult leaders. Yeah. That's a way to sort of curate your algorithm right there. When you're, <laughs> when you're a follower, when you adhere mm -hmm. to, to someone's teaching and it doesn't stick, it doesn't stick together. It doesn't have the glue. We don't see that community sort of continue uh, in its uh, sticky way. Why did you design it? Why did you design that element of community that you know otherwise may have been an anchor and source of solace? Why did it have to be so fragile? Oh, this is a this is a very interesting big question. So some of some of this is a this is a literary answer, okay? Right. Which is um, I so there's a character Martha Einkorn in the novel who is the executive assistant to the head of the Fantail social network. I have to say that none of these characters are based on real people who could sue me for a lot of money. <laughs> but the companies have quite a large relationship with companies that really exist. Um, so I have I. I've worked in technology for a long time, as you say, with Zombies Run and mm -hmm. other video games, and I know people who work in Silicon Valley, and I was fascinated by these executive assistants, mm -hmm. and because you know they're there right up close with these incredibly powerful people. I've never read an interview with a single one of them. I would really love to find out who these. They're all women, and often they've been brought in to kind of be the office mummy for um, some, you know, 24-year-old founders who are struggling to manage a company. And so I, I asked some friends, you know, somebody actually who's friends with some of these people, well, what are they like? And my friend said, well, you know, these, these executive assistants, a lot of them grew up in cults. And having heard that, I thought, oh, then I can write about that. <laughs> I, I, I came from a fundamentalist religion. I see what the... Um, transferable skills are from <laughs> from living with a cult leader who believes that they know the future and that they're the most important person in the universe and um, perhaps they're subject to fits of violent um, rage or emotional volatility. I can see how that transfers to the world of startups. Um, so in, in the novel, uh, Martha comes from this cult. She has left She's gone, she's sort of remade her life. Now she's an exec, exec assistant to a technology company. And um, yeah, she goes looking online for uh, people who she knew from the cult. And they all, I mean, it's interesting. Actually, there are some communities online, but they don't want to know her. Cause You're she, right. Yeah, because she left. And... All right, I'm going to drop a name. We're all ready. Uh, so, so I had a conversation with Ursula Le Guin a couple of years before she died, and we were talking about the possibility of utopia. And as you all know, if you've read Ursula Le Guin's work, she, she's a creator of extraordinary imaginary worlds, and yet none of them are utopias. She's always pointing out the problems with every system and every society. Uh, and, and I asked her, you know, do you think a utopia can exist? She was just like, no, there's always going to be somebody that you need to pay more attention to. The whole thing is about, it's like, mm. it's like, a, it's like balancing on a surfboard. You know, it's, it's not, we're not going to be able to create a system where everything is perfectly stable forever. There's always changing tides. Things are different. You know, something changes and then somebody's left out or somebody's been forgotten. So you, you have to be alert to it. Um, so I come from a fundamentalist community which has some amazing, beautiful uh, communal experiences. And also, it's, it's not that great towards outsiders. And my first novel, Disobedience, was about um, a lesbian relationship in the Orthodox Jewish community, which certainly at that point, they were not great at that. And things are somewhat improved now, but still, I think things are tough if you're an Orthodox Jewish LGBT person. Um, so yeah, I, 
I don't feel like I need to point to previous types of community and go, no, this mm. was perfect. Yeah, yeah. And this one over here is, is what we're doing now is bad. We're always doing things that are both good and bad. I'll tell you a secret. The world is always getting both better and worse. That's just always happening. It's amazing when you figure that out. And when you move from one culture to another, you're moving in some ways better and some ways worse. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated. So we figured out the world. We figured out, <laughs> we figured out machine learning. Um, I have to thank you for being so generous, not just in this interview, but also through your work oh, for helping you. us think about technology, the environment, markets, the economy, our peers, our friends, how we use technology, all, you know, wrapped up in the guise of, you know, just a book. Just, just yeah. It's just, just a book we're going to pick up it's just and a talk thriller. about. It's just quite a sort of fun thriller. Yeah. It is a fun thank thriller. Thank you. Well, this has been brilliant. Yeah, My pleasure. I've had a lovely time.